right. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. Who wants to talk about meetings? Yeah. So while we often don't like going to meetings, talking about meetings is, is kind of fun. So in keeping with the theme of this event, I titled my conversation, The Power of You to Make Meetings Truly Work. Now, given how much people tend to hate meetings, I did think of an alternative title, The Power of You to Make Meetings Less Time-Sucking, Miserable, Dreaded, Annoying, and Wasteful, but instead I chose a more optimistic title. Because I truly believe that by leveraging the science of meetings, we can make meetings truly work. All right, so let me share with you some data about this crazy topic. So first of all, there are around 55 million meetings a day in the US alone. Most individuals have around 15 meetings a week, but that time increases as we move up in organization's hierarchy. And at the same time, meetings has, has been identified as the number one time waster at work. But this last stat is the most sobering. Over 70% of senior, senior managers see meetings as unproductive. But they're the ones calling the meetings. So when you put this together, a high base rate activity, tons of meetings, tons of frustration, you could make the case that we are both living and dying in meetings. But for me, I saw it as an opportunity. As an organizational psychologist, the thought of studying something and working to improve something that's making people miserable is actually quite exciting, especially because a world without meetings is much more problematic. Without meetings, cooperation, communication, coordination, consensus, decision-making are all compromised. In fact, in many regards, organizational democracy takes place in meetings. So the elimination of meetings is a false goal. The elimination of bad meetings is the true goal. All right, so can research provide some help? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, I'd have to end the TED Talk right then. Yes, absolutely, research can provide some help. There's research that compares standing up meetings to sitting down meetings. Interestingly, the quality of the outcomes is the same, but standing up meetings take half as much time. There's research that looks at satisfaction with meetings. And yes, there is someone who leaves a meeting feeling like it went pretty well, and that's the meeting leader. Meeting leaders are feeling all right, but why not? They're in control of the experience. There's some research about brainstorming, but brainstorming in silence. If you have individuals brainstorm in silence in meetings, recording their ideas on paper or through an app, they generate nearly twice as many ideas, and those ideas tend to be more creative and innovative, because people aren't filtering. Well, let me share with you some other work that I've done to set the stage for some implications. So first of all, in one of my first studies, I had individuals maintain a diary of how many meetings they were having each day, and also how they felt about their day at work. And interestingly, the more meetings people had, they reported just feeling drained and fatigued. And the saddest part of it is they felt that work was not accomplished. However, however, there were certain individuals who actually seemed to thrive with lots of meetings. For those people who aren't goal-oriented, more meetings, the better. But those are not typically your best performers. So the flip side of it is that for those individuals who too do tend to be goal-oriented, which are your best performers, more meetings seem to take a bigger toll on their well-being. But here's the good news. When the meetings were high quality, those negative effects of having so many meetings were mitigated. All right, my final study. I think in many regards, this is the most important study. So in this study, we had employees, we tracked them over time, we had them identify the types of meeting practices their bosses did, and we assessed employee engagement. Now, we know employee engagement is critical to organizations. Those employees who are more engaged perform better, they help each other more, and they're generally just happier. Well, what we found is that those leaders who were more judicious in the calling of meetings, so they only called them when they were relevant, those leaders who carefully managed time in meetings, and those leaders who were able to create freedom of speech in meetings, 
employees reported more engagement. So while we often think about meetings as being places of drain, meetings can be places of gain when done right. So the overall takeaway in two words, meetings matter. Meetings truly matter. Meetings done wrong take a toll on employee well-being, frustration, opportunity costs, and even something called meeting recovery syndrome. Meeting recovery syndrome is this idea that when we have a bad meeting, we just don't shed it at the door. It sticks with us. We ruminate and we co-ruminate. But meetings done right are incredible opportunities for inclusion, innovation, return on investment, many, many positive things. So who's responsible for meeting improvement? We all are. Everyone can find some meeting that they lead at work or in the community. So we all have a responsibility to try to make these things better. Which is why my title is The Power of You to Make Meetings Truly Work. All right, so now let me tell you what do good meeting leaders do? So how can we become excellent meeting leaders? So first of all, excellent meeting leaders think differently. They recognize that fundamentally, when you call a meeting, you are a steward of others' time. And by having that mindset of stewardship, you fundamentally approach the meeting differently. Most notably, you think, because you care. You want to honor the time of others. So while research shows that 50% of agendas are recycled, you would not do that, because you will not dial it in. You want to honor people's time. So you actively make choices. Let me share some of these choices. So first of all, you go for the smallest number of people, reasonable. But you have a no spectators rule. You consider inviting people for part of the meeting, but not all of the meeting. So that, therefore, you can keep the meeting lean and not waste people's time. However, for those people who are more secondary, you choose to keep them in the loop. You still make them feel valued, because one of the things that we find in our research is that when people are not invited to a meeting, they find that just as worrisome, because they worry that they're being excluded. Number two, don't just default to one-hour meetings. Why are meetings one hour? Well, that's just the default setting on Microsoft Outlook. That is not a good reason to have a one-hour meeting, especially because of Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law is this idea that work expands to whatever time is allotted to it. So if you schedule a one-hour meeting, lo and behold, it takes one hour. But we can use this to our advantage. Given the goals of a meeting, we could say this meeting should be 36 minutes or 48 minutes. And those meetings will also take that. But once we decide on a meeting time, dial it back a little bit, create some additional pressure. Psychological research suggests that when teams are under a little bit of pressure, they perform optimally and they're more focused. Number three, be unconventional at times. Mix it up, try different things. For example, consider a walking meeting. Research shows that when you do a walking meeting, people will report higher satisfaction, and even more creativity. But there are some important rules of thumb with walking meetings. First of all, they need to be small, just two or three people. Second, you need to tell people in advance you're doing a walking meeting so they can wear the proper shoes. You want to make sure that you walk in a circle. And you also want to make sure that the agenda makes sense for a walking meeting. Right? You can't show a deck as you carry your laptop for a nice walk. Also, there are other purposes that could be questionable. So for example, if you're gonna fire somebody, probably a nice walk in the park is not gonna do much for them. But the more I think about it, actually a walking meeting is perfect in that consideration, right? Because you can just walk right to the car. <laughs> Start your meetings well. Remember, as a meeting leader, you are fundamentally a host. You called this gathering together. And as a host, you want to make people feel appreciated 
and welcome. You want to greet them. And if a couple people don't know each other, you make the introduction because you're a host. Also, as a host, it's okay to bring snacks every once in a while. As crazy as it sounds, one of the best predictors of meeting satisfaction around the globe are snacks. And it's not the snacks in and of themselves, but the fact that you took some time to think and consider others. Number five, given this meeting leader blind spot I mentioned earlier, you need to check yourself. You need to evaluate how you are as a meeting leader periodically. So ask the regular attendees, how am I doing? What am I doing well? What can I do better? What are your ideas for making our meetings optimal? All right, anyone want a bonus? All right, good. This is an important moment, because if you said no, I'd have to change my slides in real time, so I'm glad that you want a bonus. All right, I want to say something about agendas. I want to give you kind of what I see as a really exciting innovation. I know we don't think of agendas as being exciting innovations, but I think this is an exciting innovation. Instead of creating your meeting agendas organized by topics, consider organizing it by questions to be answered. Ooh. Having questions to be answered fundamentally changes the meeting. When you think of it as questions to be answered, now you have a litmus test for determining who actually needs to be there, because they're fundamental to ask, answering the questions. You have a better sense of when to end the meeting because the questions have been answered. And you know what meeting success looks like. The questions have been answered in a compelling way. And if you can't generate questions, that's your clue that the meeting does not need to happen. So, here we are at our conclusion. And what's so exciting about meetings is that with 55 million of these a day, if we can just make 20% of these 20% better, the incremental effects will be amazing. And while we can't control others' meetings, we can control our own meetings. We can do them right. We can engage in behaviors that truly communicate that we are a steward and that we're honoring the time of others. So with that, I thank you and I appreciate being here. Thank you.